Stanford University. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Dave Ballmer. I'm an independent uh, software developer. Uh, I have a, my own company called Gobico Games. Um, it's basically does uh, mobile application development. Um, right now, focusing on WebOS with Palm um, because it's cool. Um, there's nothing up here that's relevant to what I'm talking about yet, so bear with me. Um, so I also have a day job because, you know, independent software developers don't make tons of money. Um, so there you go. My day job is with a company called Hippocrates. Uh, they do mobile applications development for uh, medical reference software. So if I'm a little out of breath, it's from running over here. So you can tell I'm not like much of a jogger. So um, yeah, let's go with it. So uh, how many people here have like done regular web development for web pages and stuff? One, two, imaginary person over here. Okay, so we'll count that as two. Um, so if you've done a lot of work with things like uh, jQuery, YUI, uh, Dojo, and things like that, if you are gonna go switch over into uh, mobile development, you're gonna find that those libs don't really work well. Like you can still do stuff, but um, they're not gonna be really fast. You're gonna take up a lot of memory, you're gonna find yourself getting into a lot of garbage collection events, which on a desktop you'll never notice. And on a mobile device, you'll notice approximately re you know, 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, okay, so basically the, the idea is uh, to sort of, if you've done, and I'm not gonna focus on this too much, if you've done a lot of browser-based web development, um, you wanna pull some bad habits sort of out of your, your tool book, tool chest, either way. Um, so if you find yourself doing a lot of lookups in the DOM, you know, get element by ID, or if you're doing any of the cool shortcuts that are in jQuery and stuff, if you do that, you know, a lot, you're gonna wanna do some other things instead. So that's the sort of operation that takes a while. It's, again, not noticeable on a desktop, very noticeable on a mobile device, particularly if you're iterating in a loop. So one of the things I recommend is, uh, you know, if you're gonna get references to things in the DOM, grab them, store them in a variable, keep them for later. And then take more of an application-centric approach instead of a, here's my DOM and I've got some JavaScript and I'm gonna start moving stuff around, you know, in the DOM. So if, what happens when you take an application application-first sort of uh, mindset is, you know, you're writing your code, you're writing your JavaScript in this case, uh, and the fact that in the end, you know, you're fiddling around with the DOM is a sort of a, a lucky happenstance. Um, your application itself should have um, very little direct interaction with, with the DOM uh, as you can manage to avoid. And right now that probably sounds a little odd, but I'll explain a little bit later uh, as we go along. So the things I'm gonna focus on is more on the presentation side of things. Um, Canvas and CSS3 are like the two really cool uh, things that are in uh, HTML5 spec for presentation. Um, everyone here, I think, has already had kind of a quick intro to what these things are. Cool, I can skip some of this stuff then to make up for the lost time of being late. La, 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 la. Okay, so I'm gonna cover a couple examples. Um, something in Canvas, something in CSS3. I'm gonna talk about layering techniques, um, JavaScript efficiencies, and what I like to call trickery. Um, all right, I'll get into what trickery is because I saw a couple eyebrows go up. So trickery, uh, to me, um, you know, I've always been a big fan of game development since I was a little kid. Uh, and of course, back then, you know, game development was a little bit harder. Um, I didn't actually have to uh, uh, flip the bits myself on the magnet, but it was, it was close. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, game developer, game develop, uh, developers, historically. Um, sort of push the limits of any new device. When they go in there, they want to do as much as they can and then twice as much because that's you know, what consumers want out of it. I mean, so uh, when, you, when you do game development, you pick up a lot of tricks. Um, and I'm gonna cut ahead to that real quick and then I'll step back. Shiny, shiny, shiny trickery. Okay, cool. Uh, the big thing with trickery is to pre-compute every single thing that you possibly can. This comes down to if you're going to draw something that runs around in a circle or runs in a figure eight, uh, don't compute any of that stuff on the fly. Um, if you have a loop and in that loop you're doing some complex math, you're doing it wrong. Um, you wanna pull that out, put it into an array, uh, or make the math much simpler. So if you have um, sort of 
Um, you know, say for example, you're doing a circle and you want to store maybe 16 points around that circle, which you can use later. So if you find yourself doing very simple math with that, simple scaling, um, you know, simple uh, interpolation between two points, that's okay. Um, but you know, doing the raw calculations of you know, some sort of complex path, you want to sort of store that stuff um, in advance. So, uh, and with uh, uh, HTML5 and WebKit specifically, uh, both Canvas and CSS3 let you leverage native code without a, actually having to do native code. And what I mean by native code is basically stuff that runs a lot faster than you're going to be able to do with JavaScript, um, which we're going to go back to that in a second. And then this other thing, I mentioned garbage collection up front. Um, JavaScript is an interpreter. Um, pretty much everything you do in it creates more objects. Objects go on what we call the heap. The heap fills up, and there's another process in the interpreter that comes by and says, wow, we're using a lot of memory. Maybe we shouldn't. And so it looks for things to remove, and that's what they call garbage collection. Which, on a desktop running in a browser, Safari, even IE, you're probably not going to notice these garbage collection events because uh, modern computers run very fast. And even interpreters pretty much fly on them. But uh, specifically running on a mobile device, um, you will notice this. So this is kind of like the pre-compute thing in a way. So if you're going to be using, say you're doing a game and you want to have a lot of sprites in it, um, you know, say you're, doing a, a, you know, you're shooting something in animation, when it's done shooting, don't throw it away. Keep it. You know, keep a pool of, it, of those objects in an array and reuse it later. Um, very simple technique. It can make a huge difference between a really crappy game and, a, and a, at least a pretty cool game. So just to recap, a canvas is a box that you can draw magical pictures in, or not so magical pictures in. So my favorite editor is TextMate on the Mac. It's good stuff, can't beat it, uh, highly configurable, and if you have to use a GUI, it's the only one I recommend. Uh, okay, let me make one quick change here. So while this is loading up, um, so Canvas lets you do, whoops. A couple of really things um, pretty well. So how many people here have worked with, uh, say, Java, Java 2D or, um, you know, Apple's Cocoa 2D type stuff? Okay, one, two. Okay, cool. So Canvas has a lot of 2D primitives which are very similar. Basically, move to a point, draw from that point to some other point, draw an arc, draw a Bezier curve, um, other interesting things. Um, it handles, uh, you know, you can set scaling for the canvas, uh, so in other words, reset its internal coordinate system, which can be very handy. Uh, but it also lets you do image manipulation as well, which those other 2D libraries will do. So, you know, um, basically grabbing parts of an image, doing transformations to individual pixels in the image, saving the image data off somewhere else, uh, rotation of it, transformation, pretty much anything in there, either whether 2D primitives or images, you can do that kind of thing with. Uh, cool, I have an emulator now. So what I've got is a very simple demo. And they'll get cooler as I go along. But I gotta start somewhere. So what this demo does is I've set up uh, a very simple class, which is a graph class. I'm using prototypical inheritance for this. So uh, has everyone done like tons of JavaScript yet or just a little. You don't know which way to raise your hand because it didn't indicate. Okay, so if you've done like a little, raise like one hand. If you've done a lot, raise two hands. So I'm going to put two hands up. Okay, one hand each. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll back up a little bit. Some of the confusing things about JavaScript traditionally um, is around its object model. And you find a lot of people um, that come from other programming languages like say Java or C++ uh, have what you call a classical inheritance uh, model. Um, and the thing that really trips people up about JavaScript is it's an object-oriented language through and through, but it doesn't have any classes. Um, so how do you 
How do you make an object when you don't have a class? Well, there's actually, unfortunately, turns out to be like about 50 different ways to do that, and about 48 of them are, are pretty terrible. Uh, because what happens is, is uh, other developers sort of want to sort of create their own uh, ways of creating classes. So they create JavaScript code, which turns around and, you know, sort of produces JavaScript code, and uh, some of it can get really messy. So I happen to like JavaScript's object model. Uh, it uses uh, what they call prototypical inheritance. Um, there is a book that I highly, re highly recommend getting uh, by Douglas Crockford, and there should be a link after this presentation. It's called JavaScript, The Good Parts. Um, it's about a little under half an inch thick, and that tells you something right there. Um, no, uh, really what it tells you is that JavaScript is a very simple scripting language um, that actually is very expressive. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very free sort of language. You can do a lot with it, which is good and bad. If you're a really good programmer, you're going to make fantastic code, and people are going to wonder at you know, all the cool stuff you did with an interpreter. And if you're having trouble with the language, it will really show. Um, so leave it at that. So what I'm creating here is I'm creating um, sort of a class uh, using a coding pattern. And uh, basically, any object in JavaScript, including this function here, when I call this function, you can think of this as a uh, constructor for this class. So when I, when I go to create a new graph, it's going to call this function, and it's going to return um, basically a pointer, a reference to this new object that gets created out of this. So this sort of, starts a, sort of serves as my constructor for this class. Um, objects have this other thing called prototype. And what prototype is, is uh, basically it's a hash or a dictionary of um, you know, named elements. So all of, all of your members, whether they be methods or whether they be um, you know, data, you can actually attach them to this prototype. Um, and the neat thing is, is that if you were to create a subclass of graph here, say, I don't know, pie chart, um, all these methods that you've created are going to be in that subclasses uh, prototype as well. And if you wanted to uh, create your own version, say, of set data for the subclass, then you basically change set data under the prototype in a way that away it goes. So I'm not going to get into that too much. I highly recommend getting that book. Um, like I say, good parts. It covers all the good stuff um, in, a, in, a, in a nice, quiet afternoon's read. Uh, and you'll walk away probably doubling your JavaScript skills from that. Uh, okay, so this is a very simple class. Basically, I feed it an array of integers. Uh, it does a little work to figure out the scale because I want to have a, a vertical scale with it. So basically, it goes through the loop, computes a max. Easy stuff. Uh, it creates a X scale and a Y scale. Clears our rectangle and our canvas. Starts our path somewhere at the roughly the bottom left. <laughs> Uh, and then it loops through our data once again to draw all the lines. Pretty, I mean, pretty basic stuff. It, it doesn't get too much simpler than that. So, um, and this is one of the reasons I like TextMate as an editor. Um, you can do anything with it. So I actually have a keybind set up for a makefile. I actually am one of those weirdos that uses makefiles for my JavaScript projects. Um, and part of that is, is that I use a code validator called JSure. There's other ones out there. Um, uh, JSLint is probably the most well-known. And what that does is it basically loads in all your JavaScript and looks for really obvious interpreter errors, um, which can be really handy at like 3 a.m., you know, when you, when you can't tell that you have like a dangling comma or, you know, a curly race when you thought it was a square one and all that, all that kind of good stuff. So, wait, wait. Okay, cool. Ah, and this is our fantastic app. See, we have a graph, and four people just fell asleep. But that's okay, because um, we're going to make this a little bit, little bit fancier. So if you remember one of the other techniques that I was talking about that we, we ran through the slides really fast, it was one called layering. Now, what I've got is a CSS file in here. Um, CSS is one of those things that most developers either hate it or really, really hate it. Um, 
But what a CSS is, is, is anybody who's, who's messed with it or hasn't messed with it too much, is it's a very simple uh, declarative language for styling DOM elements. Okay, much simpler than that. So what I've got is I've had the same app, but I've invested a little bit of time in putting some styling into, well, basically what is an empty box with a line in it. And let's see what we get. Oh wow, completely different. So we've got an image, another image, and if we do fun things, like we leave the app, you know, magically it animates in and animates out. Um, all of that is, is done inside CSS. So the only thing that, that the JavaScript is doing to cause this, um, I've got an activate and deactivate method. And all I'm doing is changing the class name um, of basically uh, my scene. And then the CSS takes care of all the animation and all that other type of cool stuff for me. So I'm gonna go keep going on, the, on that path. Uh, oh, okay. This is a good one. So this is a funny little app. It's a screensaver because everyone needs a screensaver for your phone. Not really, but it's fun anyway. And I'm just gonna show you real quick. So a few things in here if we walk through the code. Um, you notice these two funny looking uh, arrays here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a screensaver where things sort of fly out at you from the center of the screen. Now I could in my loop uh, run a random, random x, random y, random x, random y, I could have some other algorithm in there. But what I've done is I'm using a little bit of trickery here. I just have some predefined coordinates. Uh, and if you notice, they're not the same length. So one array is actually shorter than the other. So what's going to happen is, is that they're going to sort of stagger and it'll end up with this sort of pseudo random looking arrangement. But again, I'm just stepping through an array in my loop, which is extremely cheap compared to you know, running a random statement or doing something more sophisticated. Um, Oh, sure, let me change the text real quick. Da, da, da. I think I have one. Is that better? Absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so anyway, I've got an array of sprite images that I'm going to, going to use. And I'm telling it, I've got basically setting up uh, a sprite pool. Again, I'm not gonna, create these sprites and throw them away, create them and throw them away, I'm going to be looping through a pool. So I've got a little loop here which creates my sprites. And all I'm doing is I'm creating DOM elements, setting a class name for them, um, setting a background image, which this is a little bit extra fancy stuff, setting a background image to match one of the file names I have in the array above. Pretty easy stuff. Uh, adding it to our DOM structure, this is what the append child does. So anyway, what this next thing does is uh, set up a mouse event, and I'll show you what that's for in a second. Bum, bum, bum. Now, there's another thing in here too. Um, something that people don't mention enough about JavaScript is, is that uh, you can nest uh, functions within functions, within functions, within functions, within functions if you want, and it keeps track of um, scope resolution for each of those. So what I have down here is I have a lot of uh, functions which are local to this one, and this is, this is another coding pattern in JavaScript. This is called a module pattern. Uh, it's also in JavaScript, the good parts. Uh, basically what it does is it, it creates um, <laughs> uh, an anonymous closure, uh, and within it I can have the equivalent of um, you know, class variables, private variables within, you know, that's, it gets really cool. But again, this, this isn't so much about um, putting in a library to pretend that we have classical inheritance. It's all about coding patterns. And that's one of the principal differences with, with really getting the meat of using JavaScript is understanding how it works and then applying a few simple coding patterns to get what you want out of it. So we have all these helper functions, one for init, one for move, one for get point, and all these are local within that one function. And the advantage is, is that all these helper functions um, have access to the same variables that the main function has, and that's, that's the nature of the closure. Okay, so we got through init. 
A couple helper functions there, found upset stages, center, next. Okay, next. Pretty much what next does is it sets the, it goes through the loop, so it takes the, the newest uh, sprite in our, in our array, and it sets the top and left for that thing to somewhere off the page. Uh, and then it sets the class name, the CSS class name, to move. And that's pretty much it. Then it goes down to, forget the path thing for a second, it goes down to the oldest sprite and basically tells it to go back to the center and do its thing. And as you can see, we're not really doing much with the DOM to make this happen. And I'm going to run this real quick. Okay, we have flying stars. I don't know if you guys can see that too well because of our background choices. So we have flying stars in here, and we saw that the, the, the JavaScript that we're doing that loop, um, the important bits is about six lines. And what we're doing is we're telling CSS3 to do all the cool stuff for us. And I've added another little thing here. So you can see this is almost like a, a particle generator because I can draw a path, really wobbly path, here, let me do a better one. So what we've got is we have the origin for this sort of moving down in sort of a fireworksy sort of fashion. So just add a little bit of extra for a little bit of extra fun. But again, CSS3 is doing all of the heavy lifting here. And the cool part about that is if we were to do this on the JavaScript side, it'd be a lot slower. Um, so I'm going to show you the CSS3 for that real quick. And again, good citizen has got to deactivate in there. Everything goes away, and it looks like it's a cool effect, like it's you know, like I'm having to work to make it go away. But really, all I'm doing is I'm stopping the loop, and then all the things continue on their paths and sort of fly off the screen. Let's go over the CSS for that real quick. And if we have CSS. OK. It's actually less in here than maybe you'd think. This is the, these are the two important bits for the CSS. I think you still read that. So, I'm gonna. Um, so we have two classes for these sprites. One is called start. And what start tells it is, well, these get uh, superseded by the JavaScript. But by default, start will center your sprite on the screen. Um, set its opacity to 1, which will make it completely visible. Set its scale to 0, which will make it, well, non-existent. Uh, in a pixel type thing. And it sets up all these WebKit transition stuff. And it's setting them all to zero seconds because what we want it to do is to take it from wherever it is. Yeah, and we want it to go to the state without having, without taking any time. So we want it to instantly do it. And then we have the move class. We want it scale up to 100%, so scale of one. And then we want, uh, I guess we're doing 1.1 second transitions for all of these different things. So left position, top position, opacity, um, and then WebKit transform plugs into our scale, wherever that went, yeah, scale zero. So each time we do this loop and we set it back to start, boom, little pixel in the middle, in the middle screen. When we, set the, when we set the class to move and then set its top and left, that's all we're doing. CSS is picking up from there, taking the star, moving it to the top and left we had, makes it bigger, makes it fade out, you know, and away we go. Um, so the net result of that is, if I go back to our JavaScript, we're only running this thing. So we're running this thing at uh, 25 milliseconds in our loop. And we're getting about five times, well, I'd say at least four times that in frame rate um, with all those objects flying around the screen you know, for having to do basically pretty, pretty little effort. So we can make this take even longer, so if we say a tenth of a second. And so everything's going at the same speed, and the net result is we just have less stars. Because all we're doing in our loop is we're creating a new star each time that we go through. Uh, this is what I like to call sort of set it and forget it animation. Um, particle effects are a very common use of that. Um, these are things that don't interact with the rest of the scene, with your game, or anything like that. Um, but they can be achieved very easily using CSS3.
Okay, cool. Any questions so far? Okay, one question. Could you go over the queuing of the sprites or how you are recycling them? Could you just like highlight oh, sure. that in the code? Yeah, that's not a problem. So the question is, uh, can I go over the queuing of the sprites uh, to show how that works? Uh, okay, next. So I have this function in here uh, called next. It checks to see if it's paused. If it does, then it doesn't do anything. This is in case we haven't set it, cleared our timer, our timeouts, and it comes in here, and we don't want it to do something when we told it not to. Basically, I have a I have an index uh, that's inside the the closure uh, called sprite index, and I just say if sprite index is greater than the length of our array, then we start over at zero. I mean, okay, it's so it's very simple. Like it's yeah, it's just okay. yeah, it's just looping through okay. that. And then the other thing too. Um, Sprite path, okay. So the, the bit where you drag it around the screen, that adds, adds a little bit of complexity to what this demo used to be, so. Um, so we've got a couple of helper functions, get next top and then get next left. Um, probably down here. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so get next top is doing the same thing. Remember we had an array of you know, top positions and an array of left positions. It's the same thing. I'm just looping through that array, grabbing the next one off the, the list, and then putting it in there. Um, and again, it's, it's, uh, it falls in a trickery. You know, we, one array has like seven elements, one array has, I think, nine or something like that. And, and they don't match up too well, so it's a pseudo random looking effect when you get done with it for very little CPU power. Cool. Any other questions on, on this one? Okay. Easy enough. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and show off an, an actual game. I'm not going to show off all of the code because we do not have enough time for that. Um, that's one of the other things too. Um, a lot of people, you know, think JavaScript. They tend to think you know small little scripts to do things, um, and it can do that. That's true. Um, but if you want to do something really cool, just like any other language, you know, you are going to have to actually code, um, even though when it, you know, in the last example, we offloaded a lot of work onto the CSS side of it. Um, you know, you still actually have to code your app. It's not gonna magically come together. So I'm gonna show this one off real quick. If I can find it. Um, this is an app called Poker Drops. Uh, it's for uh, WebOS, so uh, it works with Palm Pre and uh, Pixie. Um, it's actually written in a JavaScript framework uh, that I created. It's a cross-platform framework. So uh, this app has actually been tested on uh, iPhone, iPad, uh, Android devices 1.6 and above. Um, pretty much the same source code with a, basically a few tweaks at the library level. Um, so that's one of the pluses. I mean, we're just now getting to the point where you could use at least WebKit-based JavaScript to do you know, apps across different platforms. My favorite is still WebOS because I don't actually have to do any work to get it working. <laughs> It already, you know, WebOS already speaks, you know, sort of the language of the web. Um, so it, it's uh, definitely my favorite platform. So this is a pretty simple game, and I'm going to switch themes real quick. Uh, all the widgets in here are done using uh, the framework that I put together as well. So all the UI and all that kind of stuff. Um, the JavaScript for this basically says create a button, create another button. And all of the cool stuff is handled inside the library, and then a lot of that stuff after that is offloaded into CSS. So all the transitions that you see and everything are CSS. So if you watch, we get our little cards to sort of shuffle in. And the idea of the game is pretty simple. Uh, you want to go and find good poker hands, and then the better your hand, the better your score. You keep going, you have a time limit up at the top. Um, when you're all done, you know, there's your score, and, and away you go. And then, uh, oh, that's a lot of jokers. <laughs> You know, obvious things, you can't have more than five cards in a poker hand, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but this is all, you know, JavaScript sort of stuff using the techniques that we just talked about. Has achievements. For example, here I tried to use more than, more than one joker in a hand. It won't let you do that. It's kind of a goofy achievement I threw in there. Uh, but there's a few others. Epic fail. I haven't done that one yet. The day is short. I can probably get it, though. Um, 
So this kind of introduces, uh, I guess, some sort of a more robust example of you know what you can put together with all of this stuff. And this is using all the techniques that we talked about. So let's break it down real quick. So when I'm drawing, this leads into my, my next point. There's actually a canvas tag that's layered on top of all of this stuff, um, which I'm actually using to draw 2D primitives to draw the path that you're on. The alternative to that would be, if you weren't to use canvas, you'd have to draw, say, individual sprites for connecting all the different ways that you could connect things up. You'd have a bunch of image resources and use up a more space, so, so why? why? Why do it that way? Uh, in this case, I'm using the canvas. Saves me a lot of code, a lot of work. Um, for example, if I want to change the style of what the line looks like, it's trivial. I can change it in the code. If those were, you know, 24 to 30 graphics, I'd have to go recut all those graphics, which it makes the development process tedious. I'm also using it to capture all of my mouse events. Uh, another thing that typically happens with, you know, just browser development is it'd be very typical to add event listeners for all the cards and then an event listener maybe for the background and drag and drop and all this kind of stuff, which is really complicated. Uh, makes for very complex code, makes for inefficient code um, because you have all these event handlers that it has to watch for. So what I'm doing is I actually have the canvas laying on top and I have one event handler for basically when the user presses down, another event handler for when the user moves, moves and another when they lift up for all of them. So I only have those three event handlers for basically um, the entire game board. And since in the event handler you can get the XY coordinate of what they've, of where they tapped or where they're moving over, um, I can easily use that to figure out where in the grid that they're, that they're touching. There's some other things too. If you were just to set up event handlers on each of these cards, you know, remember that even though they have little rounded corners and spacer between, underneath you know, each one of these things is it's a box. You know, all the DOM elements, when you come down to it, are boxes. So if you're trying to draw a diagonal line between one and the other, and these are all boxes, what would happen is it would actually trigger one of these or the other <laughs> while you're trying to draw across. So this is another reason why you know, I want to completely use my own event handler for the whole board, and I want to, apparently I want to lose the game. <laughs> Three minute timer. So we'll do this again. Um, so what I actually have it doing is I have it, it's a little bit smarter. Um, when you press down initially, it's using sort of the straight grid so it knows which one you're pressing down. But when you're going around them, instead of using the grid, I'm actually using more of a, uh, an octagon sort of pattern to detect where I'm hitting or where I'm moving so that it turns these corners in between cards into sort of a neutral zone so you don't accidentally trigger things around. Um, stuff like that is... is the sort of thing you kind of need to do to have something that kind of works and something that users, it works well enough that, that they don't even notice it. And that's really what you want in your UI stuff as far as functionality is, is that they don't, they're just natural, they don't have to think about it. Um, okay, so other techniques in here. And do the shuffle. If you watch closely, you'll see these things you know, flying to their position, and then they're also sort of rotating and sort of going in a 3D kind of way as they fold in. Um, that's also using CSS. CSS has um, 3D transformations. WebOS has um, minimal support for those as of 1.4.1. Uh, so I'm exploiting it to make these things look a little bit more like cards and a little less like rectangles that just sort of drop into place. So let me pull up another. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to pull up the file. Okay, now this one I'm running in the browser um, because Safari, uh, current version of Safari, um, its WebKit actually has full support for some 3D stuff, which I'm going to show you real quick. So this is a fairly boring looking thing, a tie in a box. Actually looks really old Mac, like Mac Classic. But when I click on it, you can see what this really is is a couple of objects that are stacked on top of each other in 3D. And I'll make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see that.
Um, so I'm not using OpenGL for this. I'm not using WebGL or anything fancy. I'm just using the CSS3 transformations um, that are now available to us. And again, it's the same technique um, as I was doing with the stars. You know, I have one class for this state, and I have another class set up for you know, the rotated around spinny you know, flyout state. Um, so it makes the code for it trivial. I'm literally just changing the class name for the DOM element. The CSS for it is um, fairly trivial as well. Recent, fish HTML. It's called fish HTML because originally uh, it was going to be fish floating around in, in CSS, but it didn't look as dramatic as making things work in 3D. Um, so here's the CSS. For, I actually put all this together into one thing. I put this together um, last night. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much detail on it. But you can see that here's our little telltale, you know, dash WebKit dash. That means we're doing something fancy. Um, there's a whole set of information in this. Apple, uh, since they invented WebKit, um, they have actually have some really good information on their developer site for CSS3 3D transformations. Uh, Ajaxine.com also has some good information on this. Uh, Mozilla, um, their developer pages cover um, a lot of stuff about this and Canvas. So anyway, uh, we're telling it we want to preserve 3D says um, if I have a child node that's in relation to a parent node in 3D space to sort of keep that. So when I do transformation, it kind of keeps it together. Um, but this is the business end of it. I'm just telling it on this state, I want to put everything back to normal. So set our uh, X and Y rotation back. Set up a transition speed. Ah, oh, card flip, here we go. And card flip, all I'm doing is I'm telling it to rotate Y 180 degrees and X 60 degrees, that's it. And then you get this sort of 3D type of thing. Oh, I did get it. I got my epic fail uh, trophy <laughs> in the game. Um, score less than zero points. Cool. <laughs> All right. I pulled that up for a reason. Ooh, that's not going to work because of the web address. Okay, never mind. I was going to pull it up on uh, my emulator, but I realized I don't have a connection. So what I'm going to do, um, WebOS currently doesn't support all the cool fanciness like that in the 3D transformations. It will do them, but without any, any sense of, of depth of perspective. So if you're, say, doing the card flip, um, instead of you know having it come out at you, it just sort of you know, folds together into nothingness and sort of folds back, which has its uses. Um, if you do things quickly, the, your users may not actually notice. Um, okay, um, so I pulled it up in Chrome. Chrome supports this stuff too. And just so WebOS doesn't feel too bad, Chrome has the same sort of not quite support for all these 3D transformations. Uh, if you notice, we don't have any, any depth between any of these things, um, no perspective in the transformation. But nonetheless, it is still capable of something kind of cool. And this brings us up to sort of cross-platform stuff. Um, if in a lot of your games you're doing sort of these um, cool transitional animations between things, if you leave it up to the CSS layer, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get the best performance that that machine is currently capable of doing without having to do anything special in your code. So we have the same code here. You know, admittedly, this isn't as cool, <laughs> but you know, within certain limitations, it, it kind of does what I want it to do, and I don't have to actually change my code to, to get that done. Um, all of the 2D sorts of transformations work pretty much across uh, mobile platforms and, and your browsers. 3D ones are still a bit off. Um, but if you, if you think about the implications on this, We'll go back to this example where we're actually looking at this thing, you know, in 3D. You know, you can imagine having this be a little bit bigger. You can make a maze out of it. You can make a box out of it. You can tell the box to, on transition, to open up, you know, a lid, <laughs> close a lid. It doesn't have to be plain colors. You can texture it with uh, PNGs, uh, GIF files, whatever you want. And if you start to think about that, you kind of have the makings of first-person shooter, 
or at least a first person walker, you know. <laughs> Depends on the capabilities of your device, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, yeah, anyway. So you're probably not gonna be doing Halo with it, but uh, you know, maybe at least, uh, I don't know, Quake. There, we'll go that way. We'll go for, any of you guys know what Quake is? Okay, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, so you can imagine these, you know, little boxes and things having other things on it, and you, you kind of have the makings of something that you wouldn't necessarily expect from, you know, JavaScript. Certainly not out of a browser, certainly not without, you know, Flash or some of the other really cool plugins that do, you know, OpenGL and, and things like that. Um, browsers and mobile browsers are also adding hardware accelerated support for all of this stuff, um, which is really cool. Um, uh, iPhone currently has that right now with, uh, I think their 3.0, OS has hardware accelerated uh, CSS transformations. WebOS is, is hot on their uh, heels. Um, I heard by the fall, so you have hardware accelerated uh, CSS transformations for WebOS as well. Um, Android, not so much. Um, but, you know, they're Google, so we, we have to still like them anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, cool, so I'm, I'm like pretty much done talking. Um, if you guys have any questions or uh, you know, want to walk through some of this code? Anything? Go ahead. Um, could you, uh, the two demo ones, could you possibly send us that code? For like the, not the, obviously your app, but the, just the demo ones? Yeah, okay, so the, the question is, can I uh, make the, at least a demo code available? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be putting that up um, probably off, off my blog somewhere, um, hosted somewhere on, is on there, GitHub. Or, is your JavaScript framework first, uh, like available, or is that your personal? Um, so, very good question. So the second question is, the JavaScript framework that I have, is it available, or, or is, it, um, is it mine, and, and I'm going to. Um, so I actually have intention of making an open source version of it. Um, that's gonna, that effort is sort of underway. Um, I'm kind of talking with, if you guys are familiar with PhoneGap, I'm talking with uh, some of the PhoneGap guys about maybe, so the, if you don't know what, what they do, PhoneGap does very low level um, mobile browser compatibility between WebKit implementations. So handling things like launching emails, making calls on the phone, things like that, PhoneGap takes care of sort of that layer. But what we're kind of missing is a you know, really robust UI layer sort of on top of that. So um, yeah, so I'm, I am thinking about uh, open sourcing that. Um, other things too, you know, one of the things that uh, Palm in introduced, but I haven't heard a lot of details about it yet, is a thing that they're calling um, WebOS Core. Um, I don't know a lot of details. This, the, the implication is, is that somehow, you know, some of the core features of, of the WebOS UI um, may be available across platforms. So kind of stay tuned on that. Um, because, um, you know, WebOS has, has a, a, a pretty good framework. Uh, themselves. So the, the reason I basically have my own is because I've been doing this a while <laughs> and uh, I sort of walked in the door, you know, when Palm WebOS was new, was sort of my own, you know, my own framework kind of ready to go and, and I'm old and I'm lazy and it's much easier to use my own code than to, to learn someone else's code even if it's something really easy. So uh, that's kind of where I'm there with that. But yeah, um, all this will be available. Um, my Twitter is uh, at Balmer. And it's really, yeah, <laughs> quick slide, uh, with animation. Anyway, uh, yeah, so Ed Ballmer. Uh, and the important thing to note is that there's only one L. Um, no offense to uh, current heads of large corporations um, named Microsoft. Um, I'm not actually related to that guy. In some ways it might be good because I might have a lot more money, but uh, I don't jump around on stage. And I don't know, YouTube it, you'll find lots of cool videos, but with B-A-L-L-M-E-R for for that guy, um, and you'll, you'll see why I, I want to do some differentiation. Anyway, um, cool, any other questions about this cool stuff? Have you guys started doing any apps yet with WebOS? Beginning. Beginning? Yeah. Okay, cool, we can talk about that, I guess. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. I actually had a question, so you said oh. uh, you've been, you tested that, on, uh, that game on the different platforms, right? Yeah. Uh, which did you feel was, um, I don't know, bringing the most return because we had talked about we had talked about uh, 
what was the best business uh, situation, whether you had lots of users and lots and lots of apps, right? Or, you know, in certain situations where there was like kind of a critical mass to how many applications there were in the application store, you know? Uh, which which did you feel, do you feel you had the most, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, which okay. Which do you feel you had the most, like, <coughs> uh, success with in the different application markets? Okay, so the question is basically which application market um, do I prefer of, of the ones that, that, that I've had experience with so far? Yeah. Um, so Apple, Apple was the first, and if you go back to when the iPhone was new, well not the first first, but the first that anybody cared about. So if you go back to when the iPhone was new, they came out with it, and they said, oh you want an SDK? No problem, the web is your SDK, you know, enjoy. Uh, that's what attracted me to the platform, um, because you know, all the original apps were web apps. Um, so my first experience with, with the Apple catalog was sort of before the catalog. Uh, I had an app that was... Um, sort of a strategy game. It was a you know editor's pick and made absolutely no money off of it because it was you know hosted on my servers and then running through Safari. Um, you know, sort of Apple opened up their catalog. You know, introduced uh, the native SDK. And things sort of got a little different. Um, today, you know, if, if I were to completely start from scratch, um, trying to get in the Apple catalog is 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 tough. Not just technically. Um, because their, their SDK is not, it's not the easiest to get going. And yes, there are tons of apps out there, but if you, if you, if you really look you know, at the vast majority of, the, of those apps, they're all running very simple engines, which, you know, like there's you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 apps that do the, almost the exact same thing underneath, but different wrapping on top. And the reason for that is it's easier to go grab a template Slab a couple, you know, slap a couple things on it and ship it, you know, with their SDK. Um, and then that's another good, you know, question too. Your other question was, you know, things like concerned about, you know, will your app get recognized? You know, will you, will you be able to build kind of a following in a giant pool? Um, I think, you know, at this point, it's it's really tough to get uh, if you're coming in fresh on the the Apple the App Store to, you know, grab a giant following. It's it's. You know, you're, you're, you're behind. <laughs> you're behind so many companies, you know, right now, just coming out of the gate. Um, and just getting attention with that many apps out there is really tough. Um, Android is, is turning into a similar sort of situation. Um, Android is a different market, too. Android tends to have a lot of appeal for, well, you know, geeky people. Geeky people like to get things free or as close to free as is humanly possible. Um, and if you look at the Android catalog, if you're trying to do a paid app, if you look at it, um, right now it has the highest concentration of free apps. And a lot of this is because developers just, just kind of give up and say, yeah, we'll put it out there, we'll try to make money with ad, you know, ads or something like that. We're not going to fight the, the sort of hacker, you know, uber geek, uber geek mentality of, of the app catalog there. Um, I like WebOS right now um, because it, it is, it's easier to get attention. You know, it's, it's the newest of the bunch. Um, it's very capable. Um, there's a lot of cool apps in there right now, but there aren't so many that, you know, you can't do one that's even cooler and get noticed and actually have people, you know, uh, know about who you, who you are or who your company is that much faster. Uh, and if you are interested in cross-platform development, it's easier to take a following from, you know, one platform. You learn a lot of lessons from there, and then if you go to release on other platforms, you know, you have more resources, hopefully, <laughs> you know, if you're making some money off your app, if it's a paid app, um, you've got a lot of feedback from users. Um, WebOS community is also very tight, so the users tend to be um, really helpful. Like, they, they want you to succeed. Um, I don't see as many, if you go to the Apple Store, you, you're loaded with like one star ratings. Like, this app, this app would be awesome, except it doesn't have this one feature, so I'm gonna one star this, you know, because it sucks. <laughs> I mean, that, that's all over. Even, even like the best apps, you know, have, you know, just tons of those. Just because it doesn't do this thing that I thought it was going to do, even though the developer never said it would, I'm going to give it a star type of mentality. Um, because, because there's so many apps, you know, the, the consumer mentality there is almost, we want the vast majority of these to fail so that I have less to sift through to find the good stuff. So if you're looking for an introduction to mobile development in general, that's, that's tough. Uh, it's it's uh, you know fairly brutal. Um, whereas if you look at you know WebOS, um, 
I like a lot, you know, Twitter application is a, is a good example, you know. How many Twitter apps can you have on a platform? Well, currently in WebOS, there's like five leading Twitter apps. And each one has, you know, a, a, a pretty strong following of people that, that love this app. And some of them have defected from other apps to sort of move along. And the reason that that is is because it's an app that everybody, well, a lot of people need. Um, and it's been easy, you know, you take the initial offerings and you make a couple improvements on it and now you have like something shiny and new that's on a well-worn path, which is an app that everybody needs. And so you end up with, you know, Twitter app A, you know, peaks and then kind of declines a little bit, then Twitter app B from another developer comes in and goes even higher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you have an app catalog where you can make an entry into a, a busy, you know, a busy feature set like that, which is Twitter, and still have a shot of, you know, being recognized and, and uh, getting a following. So short answer is, <laughs> I like the smaller catalog if you're a new developer. Um, if you've been around the game a lot, uh, it makes good business sense to you know, focus on where uh, the, big, the big market stuff is. Unless, uh, and this is something that the Palmas is, is uh, the, the, they have an interesting strategy and I think it's gonna pay off for them long term. They're making it very easy to port from, say, uh, Apple uh, or even Android in some cases over to WebOS. So, you know, you've got this web app, you know, Bonanza in the catalog, and then you also have these, you know, uh, C++ apps <laughs> uh, that were actually originally written over uh, for Apple. Uh, you know, Need for Speed Underground and, you know, a bunch of EA titles and Game Loft titles that you recognize. Um, most of those titles have been ported within, you know, a week or two over to WebOS. So they're, they're betting on the really big companies that make apps going ahead and doing what makes sense to them, you know, going for the big catalog first, but then spending a week or two <laughs> backporting it to, you know, another outlet where they can have like, uh, you know, you get the advantage of the smaller catalog, you get the loyal following, you get the people that are doing higher ratings on average, you know, they, they seem to care more about your app. So it's kind of a best of type of thing. And as a JavaScript developer, you can go the opposite approach. You can start with something like WebOS, get a lot of attention from users, have them just, just pound your app and send you lots of good feedback. You end up with a really killer app, and when you're happy with it after it's been in the market for you know a month or two, try to port it to some of the larger markets. So, really long answer to a very short question. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Okay, cool. I think we're done with questions. All right. Thanks very much, guys. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.